It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to Jill on Money. It is the first show of spring 2018. It's already uh, spring training for the baseball fans out there. When does the season start? Next week. Gosh, that happened fast. Hey, if you've got a financial question, maybe it's uh, something going on around your tax filing Maybe it's something about your investments. Give us a call. 855-411-JILL. See how I did that fast? You know what? I don't really want you to call. I want you to send us an email. I don't know why. The email thing just seems to be a better way to communicate with us. Mark says it's much easier. And uh, I live to make Mark's life easy. I think you know that by now. Um. What can I tell you? This has been a crazy week. First Fed meeting of, not first Fed meeting, second Fed meeting of the year, first rate hike of the year, uh, first Fed news presser. Uh, so Mr. Powell spoke up, spoke out. Um, and, uh, you know, there's just wacky stuff going on at Facebook. Who? It, it, it is truly uh, stunning. You know what? I think someone made an excellent point, and that is um, essentially what we don't realize when we start to, um, you know, have the have the conversation around privacy or what these companies have of ours. You might say to yourself, oh, I don't pay for Facebook or Twitter, but you do pay. You pay in your information, your personal information. And I just don't think we, we have, we've gotten that in our heads. And I certainly don't think that regulators have done a very good job of helping us make sure that these companies are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So um, one of our favorite guests uh, from last year was Scott Galloway, who wrote that book, The Four. And he kind of predicted that this was going to be the downs, that this would be the potential downside of these dominant big tech companies, regulation. So we'll have to see what emerges. All right. Uh, so let's start the program off with a phone call. It is Deb, who is peppy, peppy, peppy before six o'clock in the morning in Anchorage, Alaska. Hi, Deb. Welcome to Jill on Money. What can I do for you? Good morning, Jill. I don't know about peppy, 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 but I do appreciate Mark, and I appreciate you taking my call. Of course. Jill, I have a question about long-term care. Okay. I retired after teaching for a good long time, have amazing health care benefits for my husband and myself, and at the time I retired, I elected a long-term care policy, which took a good chunk out of my insurance or my, uh, my um, money coming in every month, my retirement payment. My husband did not choose long-term care. Well, now... We've had his mother in a long-term care facility for the last couple of years, and we've decided that we do not want to burden our kids with that. Mm. So we need something for him. It's too late for us to put him on the policy, my retirement policy. What is your, what are your thoughts on what we should do? So let's get a few more details, Deb. So your pension, like that, that is actually coming to you, your net pension, how much is that? Not much. When you say not much, give me the number. Uh, you know, it's pro- it's right under a thousand a month. Okay, so I'll just say a thousand a month. And then, uh, what else are you living on income wise? My husband's income, and my husband's income was substantial enough that I could afford to teach over the years and take care of the kids. I gotcha. And how much? So right now, how much is your total? How much is his income right now? His approximately income is, is two hundred plus. Okay. And how about your savings for retirement? You said you're how old? Uh, we, I am 55, and he is 57. Okay. So um, how much have you saved so far for retirement between Enough the two? Enough to retire comfortably. Yeah. So, like, between the two of you, I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell there's a whole method to my madness, I promise. Give me in a ballpark. Do you have a couple million bucks saved? Yep. Good. Perfect. House, do you own it outright? Yes. Great. Um. And how old are the kids? 
kids are in their uh, one's 25, one's 27. Okay. And are they financially okay? No. Oh, I see. I got you. Okay. Um, And do you help them right now, just currently? We help them with college, but Uh currently they don't need our help. Oh, well, that's good. Well, That's yeah, good. Well, hopefully, and and you know, we would help them if they needed it. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, like they're, they're self sufficient, essentially. They are self sufficient. Okay, yes. great. Um, grandkids yet? None. Okay, got it. Um, and how long do you think your husband's going to continue working? Uh, he's sitting here. <laughs> how long is my husband going to continue? Oh, working? husband, forever? forever. Forever. Give me a better choice of like, ideally, like ten years. Ten years. Okay. Fair enough. Let's do that. So, uh, and you live beneath your means because you obviously, okay, so you're putting money away. He's saving for retirement. You've got money coming in. The $1,000 a month for the pension, uh, essentially, you could probably use that $1,000 a month to buy long-term care insurance for him also, right? Sure. Okay. So you got the free cash flow to do that. I ask all of these questions for a specific reason, not so much for you, but also for you, but for everyone else listening. Because if you said to me, oh, well, we have $300,000 saved and that's it, I would be like, don't worry about long-term care. Or conversely, if you said, I've got $5 million saved and my kids are all in fantastic shape, I would say, who cares? Just, you know, you'll if you need care, you'll pay for it out of your cash flow. It sounds to me like you're in an interesting, you're on the upper end of the range where I tell people to be a little careful. And the reason is that you're married, and if one of you were to need care, as you know, it can drain the resources for the healthy spouse. So, like, how much are you paying for your mother-in-law? About 6,000 a month. Yeah, so it's real. That's a real number. And it would diminish, it would absolutely diminish our savings if if that had to happen for over the years. Right. For one of you, right. Exactly. For him. Uh, Right. I mean, if he could promise to die quickly, we probably don't have to have this conversation. Exactly. Could he do that? No. All right. We're not going to make him do that. Um, Here's the, here's also a couple of factoids that we need to keep in mind that, um, you know, for everyone listening, you think, oh, I don't need nursing care. I won't need it. Someone's just going to put a pillow over my head. You can't do that. That's not how we do it. Um, So, you know, six grand a month, you're probably lucky, but the prices are rising, you know, so median median cost of services go up by about four to five percent a year, which is, you know, obviously more than two times the rate of inflation. So I think that this is something that is really important. There is an issue, of course, in that many companies have exited the long-term care business. That's the big question that, like, if we're going to go out and look at a policy, what are the options? So when we come back from our break, we're going to come back with Deb. We're going to talk about long-term care providers and who out there is actually underwriting long-term care insurance these days because not everyone does it anymore. You are listening to Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, shoot us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. You can always uh, follow us on Twitter at Jill on Money. We'll be right back. Have a finance question? There are many ways to reach the show. You can call anytime at 855-411-JILL, send an email to askjill at jillonmoney.com, or tweet a question on Twitter using the handle at jillonmoney. Just use the hashtag AskJill. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That is our email address. Before we went to the break, we were talking to Deb from Alaska, and she was calling and asking about long-term care insurance. Um, And so, Deb, one of the issues that comes up is that unlike you, who had long-term care options through your employer um, and your husband didn't take it, now all of a sudden you got to go to the private marketplace. So my question to you is, have you done any searches so far? You know, Jill, we have done some 
And one of the, the questions that we are, are coming back to is, would a one-time cash payment that's somewhat substantial, right around 86000 with a death benefit be a wise thing to do? Because that has a death benefit of 150000 um, and it has a, a surrender value. Now, that would be a big chunk to outgo, mm-hmm. but would it be worth it in the long term? It may be. Um, and, and here's the thing. The, as I said, because there are so few companies actually offering long-term care coverage, you have to be very careful. You know, some of the more highly rated ones are, um, at least that I know of, are New York Life. I think they still write, I think, Mass Mutual writes new co- policies, Northwestern Mutual and Genworth, the, which was the spinoff out of GE Capital. So those are the ones that do it. I, I guess that the lump sum is a possibility if you had the lump sum available outside of retirement. I wouldn't want you to take a retirement withdrawal, pay tax on it, and use that. But I do think that it's a possibility to have one of those hybrid products. So here is a question for you. Do you work with a um, with anyone to help you out right now, either with your insurance or your investments, or do you do it on your own? On our own. I think you may want to go look and talk – or. I think it would be worth it to get a fee-only opinion on the comparison of one of these hybrid products with a traditional long-term care policy. Because what we really need to find out is that, you know, because your husband's still pretty young, does he have any issues health-wise? No. Okay. So, I mean, it's a good time to buy it. Um, Because he is young, however, um, you know, one of the things that's interesting is that Putting that lump sum in today may be better than paying 25 years into a policy that he may or may not ever use. But we still do need to have an apples to apples comparison because sometimes those uh, hybrid policies are not sufficient to pay for the long term care need. Now, maybe that's okay for you guys because look, even if you, let's say, like in today's dollars, that you have 6,000 bucks a month that you had to pay. And if if you bought a policy that was a hybrid policy that could cover half of that, probably the three grand a month wouldn't kill you out of the rest of your investments. So maybe that is the right way to go. But I do think it's worth talking to somebody. Um, you can go on to a website called NAPFA, the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, NAPFA.org. You can go to um, uh, the CFP board's website, Let's Make a Plan. Uh, dot org because and you're looking for a fee only financial planner. You do not necessarily want to go to an insurance agent because that agent is going to have um, a view on which policy is going to make more for him or her and doesn't have to put your best interest first. That you want someone to look at your situation and give you basically a one off opinion. You could pay someone a thousand bucks for this. It's well worth it, by the way, to do that. But what I really want to make sure that we're doing is comparing apples to apples. So that is, I mean, I think both of those options are good options. I think you probably are best served by getting some help for from from a professional who is unbiased and has to put your interests first. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. All right. That's what I would do. And uh, tell your husband to stay healthy till we get that coverage, all right? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for calling. Have a great day. You too. Um, Yeah, long-term care is really thorny. It's tough. And, you know, the the other really wacky thing about it is that just it's kind of like auto insurance, except it's really more expensive because a lot of times people say, oh, I pay all this money for insurance and I don't need it. No one wants to use insurance. That's the problem. I just want to make sure that those of you listening understand that the range of people who need actual long-term care insurance is is actually for those folks usually married because remember <clears throat> excuse me if you're not married if you're single divorced widowed you've got a chunk of money you can spend it on yourself i usually say that if your assets are somewhere between a half a million dollars and a couple million 2 million then you probably would be wise to at least look at some form of long-term care insurance. 
And I think these, I really do believe that these hybrid products are interesting, but they may not cover everything. So it's a little different, but they may cover enough that you just, it, it's fine. Just don't want to get you sucked into a, a product that is going to be something you don't need. And maybe, you know, you're, you're throwing your money out the window or that you are not considering other options. That's the important piece. Okay. <sighs> Got that like big breath just came out. Okay. Uh, Mark, what else we got here? What do we have? Got any uh, calls that are queued up or we uh, should I do an email here? Uh, this is a great question. Someone wrote in and wants to know what is the best way to find a fiduciary? A fiduciary, someone who has to put your best interest first. Now that a court has actually struck down the fiduciary rule that was created by the Department of Labor, you can just ask. Here's the best way to find a fiduciary. You can go to uh, the... NAPFA, N-A-P-F-A, NAPFA, like I just told Deb, NAPFA.org, because the people who are members of NAPFA, it's a smaller organization. Those folks have to adhere to the fiduciary standard regardless of what they're doing. They can't even collect a commission, so it's pretty amazing. Other people who are fiduciaries. Uh, CFPs are fiduciaries when they're doing financial planning advice, but you can also ask them if they are held to the fiduciary standard. Um, CPAs, um, especially those who have that PFS designation, CPAs are held to the fiduciary standard. You can go to the AICPA website, check that out. Who else? Um, the, oh, CFAs a chartered financial analyst also. So, you know, the best way is to like check out those resources and be be clear to ask the question. You know, some people are saying, you know, are held to the fiduciary standard as it just pertains to the financial planning or the advice giving. You really want to work with someone who says, I adhere to the fiduciary standard in all areas of my practice. No matter what I'm doing, I am... I'm acting as a fiduciary and putting your best interest first. So take that and go forth. I think that's the best thing. And the other, and the other nine, you know, there are 10 questions to ask a financial advisor. You can go to the jillonmoney.com website and go to, where is the, where are the resources? Thank you at the resource tab. They at least have our resources buried. I can't wait to cover all this stuff. Hey, I'm writing a book, everyone. I'm now three quarters of the way done with the manuscript, Mark. Is it amazing? I'm basically done. No, I'm not done. I got to finish it. Coming out, we have a pub date, February 2019. Don't worry, you'll be hearing me talk about it a lot. <laughs> a lot. All right. Uh, if you've got a financial question, we want to hear from you. And our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Hop onto that website, check out our resource tab, but also why don't you sign up for our weekly newsletter? You can do that at jillonmoney.com. All right, when we come back, more of your questions. It's Jill on Money. Stay tuned. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Just send us an email, Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. If you missed any of our previous shows, you want to catch up a bit, just hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com. There's tabs right at the top, read, listen, watch. Listen. Click on listen. You'll see some of those old shows. You also can see our podcasts. Check it out. While you're on the website, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. Love that. Okay, here is an email question from Emily, who will be graduating from the University of Arizona, which means she's what, a wildcat? 
Mark's a sun devil, so he he didn't want me to actually read this. So, but Emily, I fought for you, you wildcats. Also, University of Arizona is in Tucson, which is way cooler than the Sun Devils, which because you're like outside Phoenix, right? Tempe. I was calling it Tempe for a while. Like, what is Tempe again? It's like a tofu s kind of thing. But anyway, Tempe. Emily will be de- graduating from the University of AZ with a degree in business economics. She's got a job offer to enter a, a big company financial development program. She'll graduate with about twenty-five grand in college debt. Not bad. Two grand in credit card debt. Her salary is going to be da 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 seventy G's. How about that? Should I speed up my college debt payments? Focus on getting a hard head start on retirement, buying a house. What's your game plan straight out of college look like? Here's your game plan. My game plan was easy. Yours is not as quite as easy, but it's great. Congratulations, first of all, because you've done a terrific job. You've kept the debt low. First priority, pay off the credit card debt. You're going to do that like within a month or two. Second, the money that you have available, you're going to be looking at, number one, using your retirement plan, because you work for a big company, put into your retirement plan what you can get in a match. It's usually 6%. Everything else goes towards paying down your college debt. So priority, credit card number one. Then at the same time, you're going to put up to six, probably five or six percent in your retirement plan. Everything else you're going to use to pay down your college debt. And then once that's done, you're going to start to put some money into an emergency reserve fund. In fact, I'm going to, let me modify that. I think you're going to do three things at once. You're going to split your available cash and you're going to go college debt, retirement planning, emergency reserve fund, those three things at the same time. So whatever you have available, look at your expenses, comb through everything. And if you have $900 a month, 300 goes towards retirement, 300 goes towards debt pay down, 300 goes into emergency reserves. Do not even think about buying a house. That's your game plan, Emily. Okay? Good luck. Let us know how it goes. Okay. Uh, This is from Lan, who loves the show. So thanks so much. And uh, he's like, he likes to hear from callers because he says uh, it it pushes me to save more because I feel like I'm far behind compared to your callers. Uh, Anyway, his question about retirement plans. I... I said him, him, and it could be a female. It's a she. It's a him. Okay. So his question is, I've read a lot about um, the 401k. Um, I have one through work. I almost max it out. I've recently opened a Roth um, IRA and contribute monthly. My question is, should I not max out my 401k, maybe 80% is enough, and put more into the Roth since it's tax-free at retirement? Hmm. Well, first of all, if you have a retirement plan through work, that's great. And uh, definitely, I love the Roth. Um, If possible, um, yes, I would like you to maybe do do both. So, you know, if you're going to, if there's only so much uh, money available that you can put towards retirement, it would be great to do a little bit of both. So perfect. Um, And um I wonder if it also if you have a Roth 401k through work, that's like the best of all worlds. That would be even better. But if you don't have that, then yeah, a, some combination works. Another question. Is it true that after five years from the opening of a Roth, I can withdraw the principal without any type of penalty? Should I deposit my savings or part of my savings into the Roth after the five-year period? To No. So, yes, it's true you can do that, but don't think about that as your emergency reserve fund, which is exactly what I think you are talking about there. So, um, no, your savings, just keep your savings separate. I think that'll work for you. I love the Roth. I love the Roth. The money has been taxed already. You know, uh, when you look at these tax tables for next year, you know, they're already in place for this year. But I'm saying that when you look at 
um, you know, like what you're going to be paying in a tax rate for this 2018 tax year. These rates are low. I mean, if you're single, um, you can make up to $157,000 and still only be in the 24% tax bracket. That's low, which means that I would pay my tax at that rate all day long. That's why I would choose to have a Roth option before even a traditional. You know, as Ed Slot, the IRA guru, likes to say, tax-free is the best possible way to invest. Tax-free. And that's what a Roth is. It's tax-free. And I know that you're you may be worrying like, well, what if my tax bracket goes down when I retire? It might, but it also could go up. One never knows. That's the that's the weird thing about what because tax rates are so low, you don't know what's gonna happen in the future. Remember when everybody used to say I can I can't lose money on a house because home values don't go down? Sometimes they do. Remember when people would say, um, I can count on 10% return for my stock investments. You probably don't, maybe you don't remember that. I remember that in the 90s. People would always do their retirement planning and they'd assume they were going to earn 10% return for the rest of their lives. Uh Uh-uh. Things do change. That's why it's nice to know whatever your tax liability is right now. All right, you're listening to Jill on Money, 855-411-JILL. Send an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter. You can do so on the website, jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back with Jill on Money. I just got a request from a radio station, which I always think is funny, when they say, could you please send us new photos? I'm like, but I'm on the radio. All right, I'll send you new photos. Darn it. If you'd like new photos, no, just kidding. If you've got a financial question, give us a holler. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Okay, this is from Luke, who enjoys listening to the show and appreciate the the to-the-point style. (laughs) That's a nice way of saying, you get to it, girl. I got a question regarding student loans for you. I've currently paid off six of eight loans. And I only have $8,000 of the original $30,000 left. These two remaining loans are my cheapest, 3.15%. I realize that's a cheap access to capital intellectually. And maybe I know I should keep these loans and just invest the difference. But emotionally, I want to pay them off and I want to be debt free. And I just got a bonus of $8,000. Serendipitous? I believe so. Here's the kicker. The most recent loan I paid off resulted in a 10-point decrease in my credit card score. Um, (laughs) They are my oldest accounts. Paying it off reduces my lines of credit. It reduces the average balance. It seems ironic that someone who's paid off student loans eight years early would be a higher risk. Anyway, it's so stupid anyway. I agree with you about that. Um, Anyway, I'm 26 years old. I'm a data scientist. I make $95,000 a year. I spend about twenty five grand a year. I put the rest into my Roth IRA, 401k, student loans, and my account with Betterment. That's the uh, sponsor of our podcast. I have thirty grand in high yield savings, checking forty thousand in retirement accounts, twenty five in a taxable general purpose account. Uh, did you ever catch that? The guy's twenty six. Luke, pay off the loan. Just pay it off. You know what? One way to say is, okay, 3.15%, that's a, a very low cost of of uh, money. On the other hand, you might say it's a very high yielding, a very high yielding guarantee. It's better than your savings account. It's better than your checking account. Just pay it off. Don't worry about it. Pay it off. Okay? Easy. All right. Tracy writes... I'm a longtime listener, big fan. I just heard uh, your latest podcast about uh, military retirement, about the 
Army endocrinologist getting ready to retire. Mark, we got to put that in the show notes so people can hear that. Your advice resonated with me as you told his wife, pick a passion career in his post-retirement career. I did exactly that. I retired from the Army as a physician's assistant in January. I took off about four months. Then I started applying and interviewing for a new life as a civilian PA. I rounded it down to two jobs. First was a well-established family medicine group. I had a union, great benefits, vacation, blah, 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 lots of upward mobility. But then I interviewed for a startup mobile urgent care in Denver. I fell in love with the company, the people, the purpose. They were four years young. I had just secured a few million, and they had just secured a few million in venture capital. I spoke to a lot of mentors. I ended up going with the urgent care, and I love my job. I look forward to work every day, even though I'm retired. My question as we transferred from base to base, we bought, bought, lived, and sold homes. When I retired, I didn't expect to ever work again. I do make a nice amount of disability from the VA. I was injured in combat in a tour in Afghanistan. I also have a pension. My husband's an emergency room nurse. Uh, we made about 100 grand last year. We bought our current home uh, with a much lower expectation for income. We have everything we need, but we want something better. We have the income for it, right? We had the income for it, right? Yeah, you probably do. My dream home is being built. We close on it in mid-May. We're selling our current home. I don't expect a big capital gain. I just need to free up the $100,000 down payment we made. We're selling another rental property. We expect to make over 110 in capital gains. We moved from that house. We lived in a hmm, hmm, hmm. I need advice on what to do with the gains from our house. I plan on using some of it to put down on our new house. But since we're using the VA, we don't need anything else um, should we make a bigger down payment on our house? And she also budgeted some money for other stuff. Um, you know what? Just given where you are in your life and you've got cash, um, I think that what you, I, I think what I would do is I probably would put a slightly larger down payment. She's got some other investment property. It's cash flowing well, so I wouldn't pay off that debt. I think I would put down a little bit more. Um, on on your current home. And that way, if you scale back, your expenses are okay. Um, and I think that that may be it. I think that that's kind of what I, I mean. You can put some of the money into like a, a surplus, you know, your non-retirement account. But I do think that for you guys, it might just be a nice thing to know that your house is sort of dealt with, taken care of, and have a slightly smaller mortgage uh, every single month, that might give you a little bit more comfort. Um, and anything else, don't go crazy. You don't have to buy the house in cash, but, you know, so that your payment feels like a nice doable amount that if either you or your husband wants to just scale back some, no big deal. That's what I would say. And beyond that, put it in your general investment account and that should uh, should do you do you fine. I like the passion jobs. Mark, aren't you lucky you already have a passion job? Oh, don't thank God. Thank me. Um, All right. When we return, we're going to do more of your questions. It's Jill on Money. Our email address, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Our Twitter handle is at Jill on Money. Give us a follow. Mark does great things with our social stuff. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. Mark's waiting for me to pick my eyes up and get my cue, and I didn't. If you've got a financial question, we would love to hear from you. Our uh, email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. That's askjill at jillonmoney.com. Brad wants to know why the wealthy have just one tax bracket above five to $600,000. Uh, and the poor and middle class have six. I don't know. I, he, this guy sent this question a million times. I don't know. Or I think he might have sent it as a, uh, I think he tweeted it a couple of times also. I don't know. 
He says, why don't we have more tax brackets above this higher threshold? It's such an egregious part of the new and the old tax law. I don't know. Don't ask me. Tax code is these decisions that are being made. They are uh, clearly outside of my um, bailiwick to control, but I don't understand it. I agree. I was wondering why they didn't have like a million. Like, let's say you make more. Why? Even if you said, okay, from you have a bigger tax bracket at like a million or two million. I don't know why they don't do that. Probably because the richest people give the most money to politicians and they've got the greatest voices. Here's a question. Um, I have two accounts, a Roth IRA and an individual taxable account. I currently have auto deposits set up for both accounts. My question, is it a good idea to keep putting money into the accounts when the market is in? (laughs) This was when we got, this was during correction. Is it a good uh, idea to keep putting the money into the accounts when the market is trading lower in a correction? Or should I deposit it in a high interest savings account? Oh, my God, this is exactly when you should be buying. You should be buying whenever the market's going down. It hurts to buy. It's so hard. It's terrible. It feels like you're going to die when you do it. Do it. Everything is on sale. Come on. Stay. Just do what you've been doing. That's like the beautiful part of getting your money to work automatically. You don't want to second guess yourself. So please, please, please keep doing it. When the market goes down, don't fuss with your plan. It's a beautiful thing. All right, you're listening to Jill on Money. Our email address, askjill at jillonmoney.com. When we return, more of your questions. We'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome back. It's our number two of Jill on Money, and uh, we have a special treat for you today. Every so often, I get to interview the coolest people in this job, and one is our guest today. Her name is Amy Cuddy, and she, uh, you may, you hear that name, Amy Cuddy. Every time I mention it to someone in my family or a friend of mine, I'm like, Amy Cuddy, they're like, why do I know that name? Oh, because she has the second most viewed TED Talk ever. She had given this TED Talk really outlining the idea that how can you actually impress yourself and others with your physical presence. And the thesis essentially was that, you know, if you were to change the way you present yourself, you feel better and it makes a big difference. So she turned the TED Talk into a book called Presence, Bringing Your Boldest Self to Your Biggest Challenges. Now, look, her real job is that she's a scientist, Amy works, a social scientist, and she works uh, at Harvard now, but well-published researcher. So right now, here is my interview with Amy Cuddy. Okay, so Amy, uh, we start the program with a very important question. Ready? Yes. What is the best financial or career decision you have ever made? Oh, geez. Um, um, Oh, this is supposed to be easy, isn't it? Uh Uh-huh. Uh, I I think it, it was to stay open to um, possibilities that I thought didn't fit the path that I was on. I think we close the doors and we say, no, no, that doesn't fit my path. I'm not going to look at it. If you stay open, you sometimes find things that fit you even better. Now, you know what's interesting about that? So you're trained as a social psychologist. and. Yes. I, I'm sure that you have younger folks around you there at that piddly little university up in Cambridge, <laughs> I mean, Harvard. I have found that so many of the younger folks that I encounter, they're so focused on their careers that they are unwilling to take a step to the side or do something different. Do you find that as well? 
Well, that's really funny that you, you ask that because I'm, I'm teaching uh, a class called The Psychology of Leadership and Influence right now to the undergraduates. And my understanding is that it's the first time there's been a psychology of leadership course taught to the undergrads. I am loving it. I love interacting with them. They're, they're, they're not cynical. They're, you know, they're optimistic. They're eager. Uh, and they're creative. When I, when I meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, they are so afraid of failing and so focused, yeah, exactly, on sort of this linear path that they're on, that I, I, I worry that they don't have any time to sort of reflect and keep themselves open to other other opportunities. So it's funny, I ended class yesterday telling them it's okay to do that. It's okay to not have a million balls in the air at once. It's okay. Allow space. I mean, I don't know. I feel like when, when I was in college 100 years ago, we were so career focused. And maybe that might be why we talked a lot more about some of the things you cover in your book, Presence, Bringing Your Boldest Self to Your Biggest Challenges, which is now out in paperback. We talked a lot about, I think, our introspection and like kind of what made us tick. And now I feel like there's this this uh, finite amount of time to get my degree and become the, the smartest person ever and get on my career. And the, it's almost a uh, it's like manic in a way. It feels a little bit it, daunting to me. It really is. It, it does feel that way. And they're actually, they're very modest. And each of them feels that, that he or she is doing less than everyone else. So it's not that they think they're great. It's that they, they never feel they're doing enough to get the right job. But when I ask them what is the right job, they're not even quite sure what that is. Right? Sort of they get on a path. But, but when I say what do you want to be doing, what kind of work do you want to be doing, it's hard for them to answer that. Mm. It's sort of what work they feel they should be doing. Uh, and I, I think you're right about the conversations. It's funny. I, I, my husband's Australian, and th there's, this, there's this term in Australia, uh, D&M, and it means deep and meaningful. And it's the kind of conversation that you have in your dorm room in the middle of the night with your friends, you know, those, those sort of thinking about the world kinds of uh, introspective um, conversations. And I don't know if students have the time to do that these days. All right. So you wrote this book after you have given your famous TED Talk, which is, I guess for a while was the most watched TED Talk. Now it's the second. So I think you got to bump off whoever's number one. So that's I, I think it, I think it bumped up. So I have never been number one. And I'm, oh. I'm very happy to be number two because I have such incredible admiration for, for Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson, who's number one. I All love right. this talk. So you gave this talk at TED Global in 2012. And it was essentially about the correlation between how um, one's confidence can improve and your anxiety can decrease when you are able to kind of get control over your body and construct this thing called the power pose. So what happened after you gave that talk? Like, just tell me personally, like, like that thing went nuts and viral. Yeah. So what happened to you personally? Um, my life changed. Uh, you know, I, I immediately was getting, you know, hundreds of emails a day uh, from people all over the world, really all over the world, all ages, all backgrounds. The challenges that people were talking about, uh, you know, range from, you know, I'm a 13 year old girl in China and I'm trying to work up the nerve to raise my hand in class to I'm a World War II veteran, and I am trying to work up the nerve to get my doctor to take me seriously when I go in to see him. Right, so that, or or I'm an executive and I feel like an imposter. I could not believe how many people were resonating with this message. That was mind blowing. But I also learned that that what people were struggling with was how to be present, how to not be terrified walking into situations that they find really challenging. And although the situations vary across people, the basic uh, description remains the same. It's a situation where the stakes feel high and where you know you're being socially evaluated. And that sends people into a kind of fight or flight mental state. And their bodies and their minds respond not as if they're going into a job interview, but as if they're being chased by a tiger. 
and that's not adaptive. So right. it really got me much more interested in helping people to get through these situations. In your book, you say that presence, and I'm going to quote, as I mean it throughout these pages, is the state of being attuned to and able to comfortably express our true thoughts, feelings, values, and potential. So what gets in the way of being able to express that? We are more focused on what others think of us than what we think of ourselves. Uh, We're focused too much on the outcome and not on the process. And we feel powerless and we consent to that feeling of powerlessness. And that's very dangerous. So I think those three things make it very difficult for us to be uh, courageous and authentic and present and connected in those moments. We'll get back to our interview with Amy Cuddy in just a minute. However, during the break, why don't you go check out the website, jillonmoney.com. And while you're there, you can subscribe to the newsletter. Mark is curating stuff all week long and sends it out every Friday. So hop on to jillonmoney.com and subscribe to the newsletter. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money. And if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Just shoot us a note. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. You know, uh, it's tough sometimes to banter around a word in like the the workplace that that has gotten so popular but it, it's kind of annoying authenticity mark do you bring your authentic mark is authentic he is it's been actually to his own detriment i might add you might probably be a lot more popular and successful if you were a little less authentic he can't help himself sometimes but isn't that interesting that is actually a problem for many of us who um sort of cling to our authenticity. I resemble that remark, by the way, because I too, I'm like, but you know, sometimes at work, you can't be that, you can be your authentic self, but you don't have to be the exact same person you are with your friends and your family. That's why in this part of the interview with our guest, Amy Cuddy, we're talking about authenticity and what that really means. Amy is the author of the book Presence and she's fantastic. So here is more of our interview with Amy Cuddy. It's weird because, like, you know, you use that word authentic in the book, and I think you used it in the TED Talk as well, and you studied it. And then it's almost like in the last, say, group of years that being your authentic self at work really came into the vernacular, especially in the business world. And I still get a lot of people who will say to me, you know, like, I can't be my authentic self at work. I I can't be the exact same person with my friends as I am with my family as I am at work. Like, how can I do that? What is what is that authenticity that you're talking about? Because obviously you're not going to be the exact same person. I mean, first, accept, and I talk about this in the book, that everyone is sort of made up of multiple selves, but that doesn't mean that there's not an authentic core. So the word is thrown around like confetti on New Year's Eve right now, authenticity, and it's not defined well. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It's not about being unfiltered and, you know, saying whatever you want whenever you want to, and it's not about being exactly the same in every situation. It is about staying true to the things that you most love and admire about yourself and being able to access those and bring them forth in these situations. That also involves really deeply listening to the people that you're interacting with and you know adjusting in order to, to make sure that they feel heard as well. You are not being um, disloyal to your authentic self by doing that. So I think that people get confused. They think that authentic means unfiltered and that you are going to behave exactly the same way in every situation. And that's not the case, but it's also not inauthentic, you know, to adjust to the situation that you're in. All right. So we all agree we got to be our authentic selves and we have to kind of find our presence. I was really compelled by this idea around warmth and competence. Yes. Um, That just jumped out at me. 
because you're talking about a study with by um, Oscar Ibarra and mm-hmm. uh, found that people process words related to warmth and morality, friendly, honest, and others, faster than words related to competence, creative, skillful, in other words like that. Can you talk a little bit about that warmth and competence yes. uh, yeah. breakdown there? Yeah, so th- it's funny because that's actually my primary area of research. So I've been studying judgments of warmth and competence for since 1998. So most of my research is in that area. So I'm very glad that you find it interesting. But we started studying warmth and competence um, uh, as stereotyping researchers. So we were studying stereotypes. And what we found was that most stereotypes of most groups basically include these two dimensions. People are judging other groups on how much they like them, how nice they are, and on how competent or how strong they are. You can think of them also as you know trustworthiness and strength, warmth and competence. No matter what, they break down into two dimensions. And those two dimensions, how warm is this person, how competent is, is this person, those two dimensions account for or explain almost all of the variance in our overall impression of another person. So if I just said from positive to negative, how do you feel about this person? Warmth and competence would pretty much be able to predict that perfectly, which means those are the two dimensions along which we're judging people because they answer two important questions about strangers. Do I trust them? You know, what are their intentions toward me? And are they capable of enacting those intentions? So are they warm? Are they competent? So that's where these two dimensions come from. The funny thing, though, is that people get them wrong when they are thinking about the impression they make on others. So everyone wants to be seen as competent, but they want other people to be warm. Huh. Because trust is much more important than competence. You know, if you're thinking about uh, an, an interaction, if you're thinking about this from a very primitive perspective, how safe is this person? It matters more how trustworthy they are than how competent they are. So we process warmth information more quickly. We search for it before we search for competence information, and we weight it more heavily in our overall impression of other people. And by extension, I mean, the really awesome part of this is that bringing it back to presence is that you say the way to establish trust is by being present. So that's kind of fascinating as well, because it sort of brings it full circle that if you are present, if you kind of know yourself, if you're authentic, if you're listening well, then someone's going to feel that there's going to be warmth. There's going to then be like this feeling of like, okay, a trustworthiness. I guess I'm wondering, like physiologically, once you've established that, then does like the brain process the competence piece or is it all happening simultaneously? Not exactly simultaneously, but we're talking about milliseconds uh, in terms of first impressions. So people are making that warmth impression first, but you know, it's within a matter of seconds. They're making impressions based on things like facial features, which is not fair and not accurate, but nonetheless, we do that. I think what you're asking about more is when you establish trust, when people know that, that, you, that you are trustworthy, they are able to assess your competence and strength in a way that's not threatening. So your competence and strength is not a, um, a threat. It's a welcome gift, especially if you're in a position of leadership where people are so inclined to first flex their muscles. They want to prove that they're the strongest, they're the smartest, they're the smartest guy in the room. And that's not the right way to go about it. I, I say connect then lead, right? Establish trust first, because trust is the conduit of influence. People want a leader who they can trust, and then they know that that strength that that leader has serves them, not just the leader, him or herself. It's it's really, it's very interesting because, you know, I know you're dealing with it in leadership. I'm just thinking about it because, you know, look, I'm somebody who's on TV and radio, so I'm thinking about it always is peculiar who an audience is going to be able to key into as relatable, right? I think that we've always tried to measure this. We've tried to make it scientific, but maybe it's not actually that scientific. I mean, in certain jobs, not just leadership roles, but maybe it's just everyone. Like if you can tap into that warmth, you are probably going to be more successful. Is that correct? I think that's exactly right. And that's I think that people see me as pathologically optimistic, and some people find it Pollyannish and annoying. But but what they don't realize is that 
by staying true to um, my belief that I have to find the things I love about people, I'm helping myself. I, I, I am more successful and effective as a person by doing that. Right. So I, there's always something that allows me to connect with anyone. Right. There's some point of connection. There's something to like about them. If we can tap into that part of ourselves, not only are we happier because we're you know, we, we see the, the world uh, through, you know, slightly rosier colored glasses, but we are much better at actually connecting and being effective and forming good relationships and being influential. So the funny thing is that people see warmth and competence as negatively, you know, hydraulically related. So the warmer a person is, the less competent they often believe they are. Not well, that's always. that's funny. But, uh, and, and vice versa, competent people are seen as less warm, even if they're actually quite warm. Uh, so whichever one seems to be dominant uh, ends up sort of costing people in, in perception on the other dimension. Obviously not true all the time, but in in first impressions, you you sometimes see this. All right, we'll get back to the interview in just a second. Hey, have you checked out the podcast? Why don't you go subscribe? It's called Better Off. Any place you get your podcasts, we can do it, uh, you know, Google, Apple, Stitcher, whatever. Any place you get them. Better Off. Subscribe now. It's Jill on Money. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life, your work life, and your whole life. That's why we've got a great guest today, Amy Cuddy. She is the author of the book Presence. And now we're getting into the meat of it. Here is what the power pose is all about. Okay, so let's get into some of, like, how did the whole power pose thing evolve? Like, how did you start, Mm -hmm. like, you started studying, you know, warmth and uh, trustworthiness and competence. And then so when did the whole power posing part of your career emerge? Uh, there were a couple of things that happened. I mean, I, 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 as I said, I've been studying you know, judgments of others. And really, I've been studying stereotyping and prejudice for years. And I'm, I've always been very interested in helping people who are disempowered to become empowered. In the Harvard Business School classroom, I was noticing that the women were participating it seemed to me significantly less than the men were participating. And when they participated, they did so in this sort of apologetic way. Right? So they would raise their hand by kind of cradling their elbow in the opposite hand. I call it the apologetic hand raise. Yeah. And they would truncate their comments so they'd rush through what they wanted to say. When I meet with them one-on-one outside of class, they're they're friggin' brilliant, right? Hmm. <laughs> they, 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 they're totally comfortable talking. So I wanted to know, you know, what was happening. I started to pay attention to the body language. And there are gender differences uh, in how male and female adults carry themselves. And men do use more expansive, powerful posture than women do. So I started to see this difference in the classroom and wondered if, does it not only express the power we feel, but can it cause us to feel powerful? So if I got the, the, the quieter students, and by quiet, I don't mean introverted. I mean the students who wanted to speak but weren't speaking. If I got them to change their body language, would they feel more powerful and confident? And would that allow them to speak in class, to take their time when they're speaking and, and so on? Talk about the, the way that you measured this and the science behind it. There's the research on expansiveness and how it relates to power. And a lot of that work was done by a a wonderful researcher at the University of British Columbia named Jessica Tracy, who also has a great book called Pride. And what she found was that around the world, everywhere that she went, people expressed power through expansiveness. So they expand, they make themselves big. That's true for humans, and it's true for non-humans. Power is expressed through expansiveness. So that had been established in the, you know, the, the, I would say the 10 years before we started doing this work. The other thing that had been established was that our facial expressions don't just express emotion. They also cause emotion. So if you want to feel happier, smiling can help you to feel happier. So it works in both directions. So the, what, what we were trying to put together were, were these different pieces. 
power is linked to expansiveness. That's universal. It seems to be hardwired. Changing your facial expression changes the way you feel. So can change, changing your posture also change the way you feel? So in our studies, we had people adopt expansive or contractive postures. They were randomly assigned to one condition or the other. They held those postures for between 30 seconds and five minutes, depending on the study. And we measured how powerful they felt after doing this. In most of the studies, they didn't know what the hypothesis, hypothesis was, so they were, not, um, they were not telling us what we wanted to hear. What we found was that people felt more confident and more powerful and more in charge after adopting an expansive posture than after adopting a contractive posture. And now to, to imagine these postures, let's take two simple examples. An expansive posture would be standing with your hands on your hips and your feet apart and your shoulders back. Right. A contractive posture would be standing with your sort of your ankles wrapped and your arms maybe wrapped around your waist or, you know, touching your neck or your face with your shoulders hunched forward. That's the kind of posture that we're talking about. Just adjusting that for a couple of minutes before going into a stressful situation changed people's feelings of power. And since you did the TED Talk, the, um, I have to ask you about this whole rigmarole around challenging some of the studies that you had done. Um, many other social science and social psychologists came under siege with the sort of a reform movement around the methodologies behind it. What is different than what you first thought since that whole yeah. thing evolved? Yeah, so there has been a sort of a methods revolution in my field in the last five years, I would say. So, it, you know, it was it was it kind of picked up about the year after my TED talk, where the methods that social psychologists have been using for literally decades, for 50 years, um, were being challenged by other psychologists who were saying we need bigger sample sizes. For example, we you know this is not the 50 people. That, that's not enough people to have in a study. We need 200 people, for example. Almost all of social psychology, existing social psychology was challenged, and this sort of replication movement began where people tried to replicate old studies. And so our studies were among those. What we are seeing is that the effect on feelings of power has now replicated 17 times in 17 independent studies. So that is what I would call a real and robust effect. Uh, it do doesn't matter if you're in the US or another country. It doesn't matter if you have uh, men or women. When people adopt expansive postures, on average, they're likely to feel more powerful and more confident. And the psychology of power and confidence um, leads to a whole sort of downstream series of, of, of changes. The finding that does not seem to hold up is the effect on hormonal changes. So we had found very clearly that adopting expansive postures led to an increase in testosterone, in circulating levels of testosterone, and a decrease in circulating levels of cortisol. Those findings, there have been several attempted replications. In most of those, you don't get all of the effects. If the hormonal effects don't hold up, who cares? If you feel more powerful, isn't that really the essence of it? It's like saying, oh, we gave this person, you know, a sugar pill and she felt better. Well, I care that she feels better. Right? right? Yeah, absolutely. And to me, the the most important variable always was how people feel. I mean, that's what you're ultimately trying to change. That's the bread and butter of psychology, right, is to change how people feel. Um, and I should say, and, and I, I don't mean to sound defensive about this at all, but science should evolve and, and people should not be afraid to put out what they know at the time, right, and, and to be open to the, the possibility that some of that will be right and some of that will be wrong. So, I, and I say, I say that because I just think it's so important for people, for young scientists not to be afraid to share their science and to know that it will evolve and that's okay. All right, more of our interview with Amy Cuddy when we return. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. If you want to go to the website, jillonmoney.com, you can listen to past shows or any part of this one if you've missed it. jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. 
You're back with Jill on Money. Uh, We are always delighted to hear from you, whether it's about our guests or you want to weigh in on a topic or you've got a question. No matter what, we want to hear from you. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And we are so happy we are finishing off our interview with Amy Cuddy. She is the author of Presence. Uh, And I'm always intrigued after people are so successful with one book, What's Coming Up Next?, That's what we are discussing in this segment with Amy Cuddy. Uh, I think you'll find this incredibly um, timely. So check it out. Amy Cuddy here on Jill on Money. Um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Tell me something else that is completely jazzing you right now. New research, new exciting things in social psychology that we should be paying attention to. Oh, okay. Well, um, what I'm working on now is is um, a book on uh, bullying and bystanding and and bravery. So I am really digging into, you know, what are the factors that lead people down those different paths? I mean, everyone can be a bully. Everyone can be a bystander. Everyone can be a brave heart. But what are the situations that bring those qualities out in us? And how can we do a better job of bringing out the bravery and of, you know, <laughs> sort of shutting down the bullying? which I do I do think has become a bit of an epidemic. Mm. Um, I think it's become more acceptable and normative to be uncivilized. Um, and I, I'm not talking about, you know, drinking tea at three o'clock, tea and scones or something. Which would be <laughs> awesome. Say, civilized. I just mean treating each other with basic decency. It's 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 seen as going above and beyond. And I think that's completely insane. I agree. So I, I'm trying to get us back to it's not just it's not just bad behavior and mean behavior. It's destructive to um, to knowledge. Right. How can we share knowledge? How can we evolve and improve um, as people, as a society, as a science? If we're we're doing everything from this defensive, mean spirited um, perspective, what I learned through my experience over the last couple of years. And and yes, you are true. You are right. I have dealt with some very nasty behavior. And I think it's fair to say that I've dealt with academic bullying. And what's been most painful for me is not the bullies, because I can see them as I I can categorize them as different, like there's something different about them. What is most painful is watching the bystanders do nothing. So Watching my friends do nothing. And it's, well, look, some people have been brave hearts. Some people have been truly heroic. They've put themselves on the line to defend not just me, but civility and science more broadly. Mm. Uh, and and they, they've, they've experienced a lot of backlash for that. But when, okay, if you have a worldview uh, where the world is basically good and safe, then you would expect that if you're being punched in the face in the town square, some people are going to come to your defense. You know, and, and so... That's what, what, what happens when you're bullied today is that you're bullied in the town square, which is online, on social media. It's mm-hmm. very, very public. And you expect people to come to your defense publicly. Instead, what, what I found was happening was that I was getting these private emails from people saying, oh, I'm so sorry this is happening. I you know, totally think this is wrong. This is horrible. You know, I wish I could help, but I, you know, I don't want to put a target on my back or I, I just can't risk it. I can't put myself out there. I hate and that. that I hate that. So last question for you, Ms. No, Dr. Amy Cuddy. That doctor (laughs) thing is awesome. Uh, So Dr. Amy Cuddy, we started the interview and I asked you your best financial or career decision. And you said being open and just being willing to go where opportunities led you. How about your worst Oh, I've, I mean, I'm not a person with a shortage of, of like sort of bad, bad decisions. Um, um, geez, let's see. My biggest mistakes sort of fall into the category of trying to change who I am. And, um, and, and, and I'm not saying that people can't change, but there are some fundamental things that are difficult to change. So rather than appreciating the qualities that I had to bring to the table, I, I wanted to be different. So for example, I was, I was kind of embarrassed that I was from this very or withholding of the fact that I was from this very working class background from, you know, 
rural America, a tiny town, um, and that I, you know, I didn't go to a fancy school. I worked my way through college as a roller skating waitress. You know, I went to the University of Colorado, and uh, that, that that what I have to to offer may not be the same as someone who. Um, you know, who grew up in, in the town that I now live in, Newton, Massachusetts, and, and went to Harvard as an undergraduate. And that's okay. All of these perspectives are necessary and valuable. So rather than trying to sort of um, shut down or hide who I am, I mean, this is back to where we started a yep. bit, I, I had to embrace who I was really love that. And when I when I was able to do that, I found all of these people coming to me saying, hey, I'm, you know, I'm from the same kind of background and I feel like an outsider. Uh, and I'm so glad to know that you're here because that makes me feel like I can be here. So it, it was it was not allowing myself to be who I was. That's see, that's beautiful. That's a wonderful. That's totally perfect way to end this. Thank you so much, Amy. It has been such a privilege. And I hope this was a interview that was slightly different than some of the others. It was great. Well, thank you so much to Amy Cuddy. Uh, if you missed any part of the interview, go to JillOnMoney.com or maybe wait till the end of the weekend. Go to the show notes. You can also buy Amy's book. We'll have a link to that. It's called Presence, and it's really well done. So check it out. Amy Cuddy here on the Jill on Money show. Before we close out the show, one more question from you guys. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Pam writes, we just received a check from a death of a family member, $103,000. It's always sort of like the double-edged sword, right? Uh, This person died. But I got the money. Will I have to pay taxes on this? Hey, kids, good news. No tax due on that. You don't pay tax on inheritance. In fact, what what happens is if the estate is worth more than the if uh, a certain threshold, then the estate will have to pay taxes on it. So remember, the new tax law went into effect, and now it's $11.2 million per person. So I'm not sure if this person died last year or this year. It was uh, $5.45 million last year. There sh- I should note that some states still have a state estate tax. Isn't that confusing? A state death tax at a much lower threshold. I met an attorney from Massachusetts recently and he was telling me that the Massachusetts exclusion amount is a million bucks, which is not very high considering that the state imposes a tax at, after the first million dollars of your estate and the federal government waits till it's over 11 million. I don't get that. That's got to be harmonized. But the good news for you, Pam, is there will be no tax due on that 103 thousand dollars what are you going to do with it that's what i want to know what are you going to do with it? are you going to uh, pay down debt of your own are you going to fund your emergency reserve fund are you going to put a slug of money into your retirement accounts are you going to put money into your 529 accounts so many choices so happy that you have that though and that there is no tax due So good luck, Pam. Give us a holler if you want to know what to do with that money. Okay, that's it. That's the show. Thank you so much for listening. It's been wonderful. Thanks again to Amy Cuddy. You can check out her book, Presence. It's out in paperback. And uh, if you've got a question, don't forget, all week long, Mark is combing through the emails. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And hop onto the website, JillOnMoney.com, and subscribe to our newsletter. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening.